go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together, and now we just pray for the word that uh, you have prepared in me, and I have uh, prepared to preach to those who are here. May you bless the, uh, the preaching of your word, and may our hearts be ready to receive it and to walk in obedience to it. And uh, I pray that you use me as your vessel, help me to step out of the way, and uh, to, your, to your spirit do its work, his work in me. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so our service does look a little different today. I, we had told you that in December we were going to start um, a new uh, order of service. So that's why we've done the three songs, and now we have the sermon. And uh, after the sermon, we'll have a song that's dedicated to time of prayer. And that prayer can take place in your seat, or if you want to come up front and receive prayer, that's completely up to you. Uh, but we are going to have that time, de- that song dedicated to that time. Uh, but if you would open your Bibles with me, uh, John chapter 18 is where we are at this morning. And if you need a Bible, there's a Bible in the seat backs. Uh, feel free to grab it and you can follow along with us. I would encourage you to, to, to get a Bible because we are going to be uh, looking at several different texts uh, this morning. But we are in John chapter 18, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at verses 12 through 18, and then we're going to look at verses 25 through 27. And the reason why we're doing that is because our verses about Peter's denial, they're sandwiched in between the trials of Christ, and and as he travels from place to place along his trial. But today I just really want to pull out uh, Peter's denial, talk about that, and then next week we'll talk about the trials that, that Jesus faced in John chapter 18. So uh, John chapter 18, verses uh, 12 through 18, and then I'll read 25 through 27. It says, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the high, for he was the high priest, excuse me, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. And then uh, verse 15 says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. And then we skip down to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. Verse 26, one of the servants of the high priest and relative of the man who, whose ear Peter had cut off asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it and at once a rooster crowed. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we... Uh, here we are, our text is Peter's denial. It's a well-known passage uh, by, by many, and yet there are, there are so many things in there that are useful for us today and so many things that we can learn from. Uh, Peter's denial is a tragic example of the human condition, and what I mean by that is a natural state of man, our sinful, our sinful state. We know that the Bible is very uh, honest with us when it comes to our sin, and the Bible tells us that all have fallen short of the glory of God, not just some, but all. And like Peter, we have to be honest with ourselves and we have to recognize that we have failed God. In a sense, we have betrayed him because uh, that's exactly what Peter did in our passage. He betrayed God and, and we are like Peter. We have betrayed him because we have sinned against him. Uh, we have done what we, is, what we think is right in our own eyes versus what God says is right in his word. And we continue to do this. We do this all the time. And, you know, God has required us to be holy as he is holy. That's the standard in which we are graded against. And we have to be honest with ourselves and say that we have all fallen short of that. That says a lot about us and how much we have in common with Peter. 
Uh, Peter's one of those disciples that usually says, uh, speaks first and thinks later, right? And, and how many times do we see that, see that in ourselves? How many times do we regret saying something before we actually thought about it or prayed about it? Uh, we can see our own actions, behaviors, reactions in Peter. Uh, he's very quick to speak up, and, 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 and that's just like us. Um, we, we fly by our emotions, and uh, Peter seems to be that type of personality. So for us, you know, we can relate a lot to Peter and, and how he interacts with Christ and the other apostles in the Bible. But if we're going to be like Peter in a sinful way, then we also have to rejoice in the fact that we are like Peter in the sense that, that God gives us grace. Right, because we can see it in, in Jesus' interactions with Peter, the grace that he gives to Peter, and we can see it how, even as Peter is restored later on, uh, we can see that there's grace upon grace that is available to Peter. And if that's available to Peter, we also have to recognize that, that as Christians, those who have professed Christ, who have placed their faith in Christ, that that same grace is, is available to us. And that's a blessing, right? Amen? That's a blessing because every single day, we're Peters. We make mistakes. We fall short of the glory of God. We, we speak first, think later. You know, all those different things. And uh, we all need uh, that grace upon grace that is available to us. So today, what I want to do with you is I want to look at Peter's denial from John's perspective. Okay? We're also going to take a look at other perspectives too, because there are some things that are missing that are very vital um, they were missing from John's account that are very vital to the whole story and understanding what exactly went on here in this denial. But the purpose of us looking at uh, this denial is to see how it happened. You know, anytime there's a sin, anytime there's a mistake, I've spent 20 years in the environmental health and safety field. And my, the bulk of my job is, is, is uh, investigating in incidents and investigating injuries and every time something bad happens, there's a chain of events that are waiting to be identified so that you can find a root cause. And once you find that root cause, you can understand how it happened. And that's exactly what I want to do with you today. I want to look at the scriptures and I want to identify all these chain of events that happened to, to reveal how it was that Peter denied Christ. But then I also, the reason why you do that is, why, the reason why you un, under, uncover the root cause is so that you can identify things to watch out for. And I want to do that with our text too. I want to identify things that we need to be watching out for. And then lastly, I want to determine what it means that we have all betrayed Christ. But yet there is grace upon grace that is available to us. Um, I, I want to end the sermon that way because it's so encouraging. So first, let's look at our passage and let's identify... What led Peter to deny Christ and things that we need to watch out for? So as we look at our passage, the very first thing that we'll see is that Peter was overconfident. And that's, that's where we need to start. He was overconfident in himself. When Jesus tells the disciples about his crucifixion, it was Peter. Peter's the one who, who boasts about his projected commitment to the Lord. And we can see that by turning to Mark chapter 14. So hold your place there and then turn back with me to Mark chapter 14. And I want to read verses 27 through 31 for you. Mark 14, 27 through 31. It says, And Jesus said to them, and he's speaking to the disciples. He says, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now listen to what Peter says here in verse 29. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Imagine being the other disciples. Peter gets up. And he says, no, 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 no. Even though they're all going to fall away, I'm going to be with you all the way, Christ. I'm going to be with you all the way, Jesus. Can you imagine their reaction and, and, and how when they heard those words? But then uh, he continues. He says in verse, well, let me read 29 again and I'll read through it. 
Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then they all said the same thing. So now we can turn back to John. Hold your place there in Mark 14 because we're going to revisit it again with our next, um, our next point. But we can see here how Peter boasts about his projected commitment to the Lord. And we can see his overconfidence in himself. As we look back at that, that was very foolish. We look back at that scripture and we're like, ooh, we just cringe. It's like, how can he say something like that? But we have the advantage of a Monday morning quarterback. It's just like watching your favorite team on Sunday and then watching the replay on Monday. And you're looking and you're like, what were you thinking? Well, on Sunday, they were just thinking about trying to get the first down. They were trying to get the touchdown. But on Monday, as you look back at what was happening, you're able to look at it frame by frame and look at it in a different perspective. So we get to look back at this whole thing in a different perspective when we get to ask the questions. What was Peter thinking? Why was he? Uh, why did he do that? Why did he react in that way? Well, first of all, Peter made this bold prediction in the safety of his current circumstance. And this bold prediction by Peter was made all the way back in John chapter 13, right? And when, when, John, when, when Peter makes this uh, bold prediction, we're using John as a timeline of events, okay? So what we talked about in Mark 14 actually takes place around John chapter 13. So what we have to recognize is this was still within the Passion Week, but this was th- well before things got real, before persecution really started to set in. And it was around this time in the safety of, of his environment that Peter saw his devotion to the Lord as better than everyone else. I mean, he confessed it. He says, even though they all fall, they'll all fall away, I will not. And he was very confident about that. But we know different. Why? Because we know what Peter did in our text. See, along the way, it's not like Jesus was surprised about what Peter did in his denial. Along the way, Jesus corrects this overconfident, prideful attitude in Peter. And he even gives him and all the other disciples a very important lesson. John chapter 15, when he talks about the parable of the vine and the branches, and he tells the disciples in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. You have no life apart from me. Unless you're connected to the vine, you are, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, and, and the only thing that's left for you is to be devoured by God's wrath. But... If you are connected to the vine, you have life, eternal life. And then Jesus tells them, apart from me, you can do nothing. See, it wasn't until after Peter denied Christ that he found out where his true worth came from. Just like Peter, you and I, we are tempted to be overconfident. We we may think or we may say what we will do when the time comes not counting the costs of the situation and elevating ourselves and our dedication to the Lord. It's easy for us to say something when the situation is safe or when the circumstance is safe. It's a different story under fire. It's a different story facing persecution, facing loss. And we have to recognize that and we have to understand that It does not pay for us to be overconfident because, number one, we sound just as foolish as Peter did. In fact, we need to do the opposite. We need to wait on the Lord and we need to be confident in him and not in ourselves. See, many see themselves as a person like Moses. We go back and we read the story of Moses and, 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 you know, you may look at that story and try to relate to one of the characters in that story. And I think many people go towards Moses and they think themselves as a great leader or, or a, a, a great um, convincer, a great person, whatever the case. But if we are honest with ourselves, we are not like Mo- Moses, but rather we are like the stubborn and unbelieving Israelites. That's kind of who we exemplify. Because think about it, look in your, at your own life. 
when things are going well, most of us are doing well. But the minute things start to happen in our lives, we lose faith. We lose faith. We forget to pray. We forget to trust. We forget that God has already brought us through so much. We're like the Israelites. Remember who the Israelites were? They wanted to go back to slavery. Instead of being free in the desert and eating the manna, they, they, they were complaining that they wanted to go back into slavery because they had better food than what they were eating in the desert. And Moses had to continually remind them that they were God's people. They didn't belong to Pharaoh. They belonged to God. He continually had to remind them. He continually had to tell them and to calibrate them. That's us. We're the ones who complain to Moses about how good we had it as slaves. Well, many see themselves as a fierce warrior like David. But again, we are more like the cowering Israelites who ran from Goliath's challenge. The point is, is that we should see ourselves for who we really are. We are sinners saved by grace. And that is great news. It may not sound like great news, and it's very hard for some people to call themselves a sinner and to see themselves that way. But we are. Remember, the mark is to be holy as God is holy, and we have fallen short of that. That's why we need a Savior. We are sinners who need a Savior, and that Savior has been provided for us in Jesus Christ. See, if we are going to see ourselves in this light, if we are going to see ourselves this way, that means that we must humble ourselves before God. And that's what Peter should have done. 1 Peter 5, 6, this is what he says. I think Peter the apostle learned his lesson, walked in repentance, and and as he had a chance, he taught other Christians, look, listen, don't, don't follow my example. Don't be overconfident. But instead, in 1 Peter 5, 6, he says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. Let God do that. Let God exalt you. Let God encourage you. Let God be your help. Let God be your rock. We can't self-help our way through life. We have to cling to Christ. See, outside of Christ, you and I, we are weak, we are pitiful, and we are poor. He is the one who is our all in all. Without him, we are nothing and we amount to nothing. We go back to John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So our confidence must be in him alone. We cannot trust in our own abilities. We cannot trust ourselves. We must know that in him we live, we move, and we have our being. We have to know that. And we have to to know that, and if we forget it, we have to remind ourselves of that every single day. Because if we forget about that, we're going to rely on ourselves, we're going to fail, and our faith is going to fail. Because we think that we're the ones who have to have the faith. We're the ones who have to carry the burden. Christ has done all that on the cross. We are to have faith in him. He is our all in all. Secondly, not only was Peter overconfident himself, but as we we look at our text, we see that Peter failed to pray. That's the second thing we see. He failed to pray. You know, Jesus actually told him to be praying. And Peter failed to listen Look at Mark chapter 14. Uh, I'm going to read verses 37 through 38 for you. And he came and found them sleeping. And this is talking about Jesus and the disciples. Jesus came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, now he said this to, to Peter specifically. He said, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit Indeed, indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, there is no denial that this was spoken to Peter and that Jesus told Peter to be praying. Uh, this, he said that specifically to Peter. 
Now, when we look at Jesus' words, his words hit the nail right on the head because Peter would fall. He would fall to temptation. He would fall to an unhealthy sense of pride in himself. And he would find out how flesh, or rather how weak his flesh is. Those are the things exactly that, that Jesus had exactly told Peter to be praying against, to be asking help from the Lord, and this is where he failed. See, Peter was warned to be in prayer for the coming temptations that he would experience. But instead of praying, what did Peter do? He slept. Peter gave in into his sleep. Now, I mean, many of us have been extremely tired. And I'm sure Peter, was t- he was tired. Many of us have been so tired that, that all we can think about is our bed, a nice, uh, uh, comfortable pillow, and, and a big, thick blanket. Just curl up in bed right now and go to sleep. It sounds good right now with this weather and everything, right? And we think, well, my body is tired. I have to do this. And Jesus is saying, no, fight that at this moment because what you're about to face is extremely difficult and you need to be in prayer, Peter. You need to be in prayer. See, Peter's struggle is something that is common to all of us. Our inner being is excited about serving the Lord. How do we know that? Well, because we have all these dreams and aspirations about what we're going to do for the Lord. And it sounds great. When we're alone, when we're in bed thinking, it may be at work, daydreaming, whatever it is, we have these dreams or we have these aspirations of how we're going to serve the Lord, how we're going to uh, you know, make his kingdom even uh, greater, what we're going to do, how we're going to participate in that. But the flesh, our flesh makes excuses all the time. And the dreams that we have, most of the time, they don't come to fruition because we make an excuse about it and we don't do it. We say if it were not for this or if it were not for that, we would be obedient to God. If it were not for this, I would have been this. Or if it were not for that, I would teach Sunday school. If it were not for this, I would help out with the extended session. If it were not for this or that, I, I, I would do something for the Lord. And yet we have to be honest with ourselves. Many times, those are just excuses. Many times we have our priorities in the wrong place. We forget why God created us. Remember, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. And we are just like Peter. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is so weak. And we find ourselves falling and falling and falling more to the flesh. How does that happen? I'll tell you what, if you are in that situation and you're, you're, you're falling to your flesh, you're failing in sin, and you recognize it and, and it's something that is just really bothering you, I want to ask you something. How often are you praying? Are you spending time in prayer with the Lord? Or are you trying to get through this on your own? It goes back to being overconfident in your own abilities. I'll, I'll pray when I need to. We need to pray every day. If, if we are people who lack prayer, then we are people who have too much confidence in ourselves. We are people who do not recognize how much we need the Lord. And it's completely true, and we all get caught up in it. We all do. We all get caught up in it, and it's something that is dangerous for us, and it just has ill effects, Ill effects on us. See, Jesus says it is for this or that that we need to be in prayer. This or that shouldn't keep us away from prayer, but it's all that we have to deal with. All that we have to be equipped for. That's why we should be praying. 
And the struggle goes beyond prayer for all of us. It infiltrates every facet of our lives. See, too many times we are like Peter and we fall into temptation to do other things rather than pray, rather than serve the Lord. There's always something to do. There's always somewhere to go. There's always someone to, I would say, talk to, but really it's correspond with. Because really, we don't talk to each other as much as we correspond with each other now. Right? Back in the day, you used to want to talk to somebody, you pick up the phone, and you talk to them. But now, we're behind our screens, and we're texting more than we're talking. Or we're posting more than we're talking. So there's always something for us to do. Well, we are like a vehicle who is running on a single tank of gas without ever filling up. You ever try to do that, see how far you can go on a tank of gas? You get down to the very, very, very end, and you know you need to stop and get some gas before you run out. That's us. We're trying to do everything we can, and then we'll pray. It's like, well, let me exhaust myself. And then when I really need the Lord, I'll go to him in prayer. But is that really the way it's supposed to work? I don't think so. Jesus says, pray without ceasing. In other words, come to the fountain all the time. It's open for you. Fill up any time you need. It's available to you. Are you hurting? Pray to me. Are you needing? Pray to me. Are you sick? Pray to me. Are you overwhelmed? Pray to me. Seek me and you will find me. This is what we are commanded to do. Peter failed to do it in this situation. and Look what happened. Whenever we sin against God, whenever we succumb to our weaknesses, to our flesh, it's because we're not people of prayer. We need to pray to the Lord, not at the last moment, not when we really, really need it. We need to recognize that we need it all the time. Third, we see that Peter validated his sin. See, as we come to his first denial, it's important that we identify some important details here. In verse 15, the Bible says that Peter and another disciple would follow Jesus at a distance after he was arrested. Let's look at verses 13 and 14 first. It says, first, they led him to Annas, Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now, that's important. That sentence right there and the the words that are used to uh, describe Caiaphas, They're important to understanding what exactly is going on. Verse, and I'll explain here in a minute. Verse 14, it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient for one, that one man should die for the people. Now, going back and looking at verse 13, there's an interesting fact there that, that Annas was actually the high priest at the time, um, at, at this time right now. He was actually the high priest of Israel. But what had happened was that For some reason or another, historians really don't know, but the Romans had moved him from his post because a high priest served for a lifetime. So they removed him from his post and they replaced him with Caiaphas. And that's why the text says that he that Caiaphas was the high priest that year. So what the Jews were doing, they arrested Jesus. And when you arrest somebody like that, you take them to your leader. And they were taking him to Annas, they were taken into the person who they saw as a high priest. Even though the Romans didn't recognize Annas as a high priest, the Jews did. They took him over there first for Annas to approve of his arrest and his trial to begin. So they go from the house of Annas, and then they go to the figurehead, Caiaphas. Because they understand that they have to get Caiaphas' approval too, because Caiaphas is their link to the Romans. And eventually that's where they're going to try Jesus in the Roman court so to speak. So they go from Annas, and then they go to Caiaphas' Caiaphas's house. And after stopping at Annas' house, they 
took Jesus uh, to Caiaphas' house, excuse me, they took him to Caiaphas' house, and then it was there where Peter and the other disciple, uh, who is believed to be John, he followed, they followed Jesus. Now, John, the Bible says, was able to go through the gate and into the courtyard of Caiaphas' house because uh, he knew the high priest, but Peter was not able to go in. Peter had to uh, look from the outside. Now, in order for Peter to get in, John had to go to the door, and he asked the servant there to allow entry for Peter. Now, what's, what's funny about this whole thing is that John is really never questioned about being a follower of Christ. Only Peter is. That's beside the point, but I just thought that was interesting. Peter's the one who is asked uh, three times if he's a follower of Christ. They kind of just left John alone there. But so Peter, as Peter comes through the door, look at verse 17. The servant girl there asked him, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? Now, look at the question. It's, it's, it's constructed in the negative tense, and it's basically just giving Peter the answer. It's almost that there's no pressure to this question. It's almost as if one of those things you do just to make sure. So Peter is coming through the door, and she says, hey, you're not one of his disciples, are you? Peter says, no, I'm not. She's like, oh, okay, well, come on in. And Peter just goes in. See, Peter wanted to gain entry, so what did he do? Well, he lied. He lied in order to do so. But in the process, he denied Christ for the first time. Now, to me, that's very interesting that his denial, you know, Jesus predicted, prophesied that he would uh, deny him three times. It's very interesting that this first denial was like nonchalant, validating sin and just like, no, I, I need to get in there. I need to be close to him. So, no, I'm not his disciple. It's interesting that it started that way. But as we start looking at sin, doesn't sin usually start that way? It's almost like, ah, uh, it's not going to hurt doing this one time. How many regrets do you have after saying that? I know I have plenty. But you see this validation of sin from Peter. Again, Peter wanted to gain entry, so he lied. But in a bigger perspective, perspective in a bigger scheme of things, He denied Christ. See, we must be careful not to fall into the temptation of validating our sin. And this is something that's very easy to do. It's easy to validate sin, especially when we see that it benefits us. And we are really good at pointing out sin when we're looking at someone else. We're like sin snipers. From far away, we can see some sin. We can call it out. We can talk about it. But when it comes to our own, man, we're blind to it. We we validate it. Even when our sin is very comparable to the person that we're judging, the person that, that, that we're comparing ourselves to, even when it's Almost exactly the same thing. Well, mine is different because of this, this, or this. See, we have to be careful about validating our sin, even if it does benefit us. And we have to ask ourselves this question, what is really happening in the grand scheme of things when we validate sin? See, when we validate sin in the grand scheme of things, we get used to it. We get used to sinning in that way. And even though it may start off with something small, it's, it's like the snowball effect. It starts rolling downhill with a very small snowball. By the time you get to the bottom, it's this huge, huge thing that's uncontrollable. And it's, 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 it's just causing havoc in our life. And we got there by validating it, by getting used to it. We need to understand that something that is so small, 
or even if something is so small, it can grow to something serious and it can be extremely harmful to us. And then the last thing that we see is that Peter, Peter thought too much of the world. See, after Peter was allowed entry into the courtyard and he made himself comfortable, it says in verse 18 that he made himself comfortable right in, in the fire, not in the fire, but around the fire. And he was warming himself. Now, it seems like he was trying his best to fit in with the people around him. He had, already ident- he had already denied that he knew Christ for the first time. And as he sat there or stood there and he warmed himself, uh, he tried to see what was happening. But others started to come around. And they recognized him. And they asked him the same question that the other servant did. And he denied it. They asked, are you one of his disciples? He said, no, I'm not. Then an eyewitness recognized him. Look at verses 26 and 27. It says, One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And then it says, Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Now, when you read that, you know, it's, it's, it's just what it is. So John just puts it the way it is. And Matthew, but Matthew does a, very, a better job of describing exactly how Peter responded to that. I want to read Matthew 26, verse 74 for you. This is a, more, or this is a better depiction of, of, Jesus, or excuse me, of Peter's tone whenever he's asked the last question. It says, then he began to invoke a curse on himself and he began to swear, I do not know the man. So it wasn't like, no, I, the last one wasn't like, oh, I don't know him. No, I, you're mistaken. I don't know him. I mean, Peter, he was enraged. He got upset. The Bible says that he began to invoke a curse on himself and he began to swear. Maybe he sweared about Christ. Maybe he said, I don't know that explicit man. We don't know. But we know whatever he did, it tore him up and he sinned greatly against the Lord. And you sit here and you think, man, why would Peter do something like that? Especially after being warned about denying Christ. Wasn't he thinking about what Jesus said? In the moment, no. You know how I know that? It's because we have the word of God. The word of God tells us not to sin in a million ways, and yet we find a way to do it. We forget. We suppress. We do a lot of different things, the same as Peter did. See, Peter lied and denied Christ the last two times. Why? Well, it seems like he was afraid. He was afraid that people would notice who he was. But I want you to notice something. The people, every single person who questioned Peter, the Bible says that they were servants. See, Peter wasn't on trial here. These weren't officials questioning Peter. Jesus was on trial. These servants were asking who he was and if he was a servant of Christ. And Peter was fearful because he wanted are he made much of the world around him instead of making much of the God that he served. Now it's a reminder for us that we are tempted to do this, to do this every day. And we fell at it many times. We make much of people's opinion about us. We make much about people's opinion concerning Christ. We hold back truth at the sake of of saving ourselves from trouble. At the moment, when we do that, we are more comfortable with denying truth than having an uncomfortable conversation or dealing with an uncomfortable situation. We're no different than Peter. We have all done this. But we must always remember We must always remember 
that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. We need to fear him. We need to fear him first and foremost. Not the world. Not what people will do to us. The Bible says we must fear the Lord. Now, I I would not do you any justice if I just left the sermon here and said, okay, let's pray and be better than Peter and we're all good. Right? That you know I'm not going to leave you here. Because although these are things are these are helpful things for us to identify and things to stay away from, to learn from, there's a bigger picture here. And this is what we have to understand. The bigger picture is God's handling of Peter and how that shows us the unlimited depths of his grace. Peter, Peter's denial teaches us something really important about ourselves and also something really important about God. And this is especially true as we consider how Jesus forgave Peter for his sins. There are two things that stand out. Number one, what we learn about ourselves is we learn about our our sinful condition. We learn about the condition of the human heart. Listen to this out of Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The translation of the word sick is incurable. Incurable. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Tell you what, that is a frightening passage. It truly is. If you believe God at his word, it's a frightening passage. There are two terrible things said in this passage about us that we should be concerned about. Number one, it says that we have a Desperately sick heart, a sick heart, and it's meant to be incurable. In other words, we need a new heart. That is extremely alarming. Just think about it. If you're alive today and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you need a new heart. You're not going to live unless you get a new heart. Then you understand the, the whole gravity of that situation. Spiritually speaking, Our hearts are wicked. That's why it's unsafe and unwise to follow your heart. Your heart will lead you to sin. And God says here in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And then he says this in verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. To give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his deeds. See, if it were not for God giving us a heart transplant, and if it were not for God judging us according to what Christ has done rather than our sin, we would be in a terrible predicament. When we see a passage like that, we need to... Worship and praise the Lord for what he has done for us. Because otherwise, if we did not have Christ, otherwise, God would be searching our hearts. He would be testing our minds and we would receive the due punishment of our sins. But he has not done that. He has decided to give us grace upon grace in Christ. Second thing is, second thing we learn is we learn something about ourselves, and then I said we learn something about God. We learn, what we learn about God is the kind of people he died to save. Now, I know that sounds like it's about us, but it's really about God. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8 says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. Verse 8, but God 
shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, the greatest claim as Christians isn't that we are good people. That, that is not the greatest claim. I know you, you know me. And there are many things that we don't agree on, but there's one thing that we can agree on. Neither one of us are good people. Amen? So that's not the greatest claim that we have, that we are good people. The greatest claim that a Christian has is that he or she are sinners saved by grace. That is the greatest claim that we have. We have all betrayed Christ. We have all gone our own way. We have all sinned against God. And yet he offered Christ as an atonement for our sins. And to that we should say amen and amen. Peter's denial of Christ brings to mind what John says in his first chapter of this gospel. He says this in John 1 verse 16. And this is beautiful. This is definitely one of those, one of those passages that, that I'm going to find somewhere to put. From his fullness, we all have received grace upon grace. And I want to end the sermon this way from R.C. Sproul. He says this about what we're talking about right now, this grace upon grace. He says this about Peter's denial and God's reaction to it or how God handled Peter. It says he had no need to die for people who are sinless, for there are no such people. He gave himself for people who have it in them to betray him, people like you and people like me. However, he will never betray those whom he sets his love on but will love them faithfully for all time. Praise God. We are going to end our service with a time of prayer. And it is in this time of prayer that our praise and worship team is going to come up here and they're going to, they're going to play a song. This gives you time to think about what has been preached on, what has been said. You can pray in your seat. If you'd like to come up front, you could pray. If you want to pray with somebody, you can bring them up here with you and have them pray with you, for you. You can stand, you can sing. This is just a moment of of complete worship to what God has revealed in his word and what God God has done in your heart. This is a celebration of who, who he is. So we're going to take this time to do that.
worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the angels near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise. before you and we thank you for this worship service and we thank you for the word that was preached the word that was shared through your spirit and how your spirit has spoken to our hearts we are like peter in many ways and there are many pit holes that we step into there are many things that um, that we forget that are vital to our Christian life. We just pray that you help us to remind us of those things and that you keep us from the evil one, that we may not sin against you. We ask that you help us to be obedient to you in word and in deed and to bring glory to your name. But most of all, we thank you as we look at Peter and how he exemplifies our human condition and our heart, we are so grateful that you saved a people like us. We are so grateful that while we were yet sinners, your son gave his life for us as a ransom that we may be saved through his blood. We celebrate that. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. I think my son is ready to go.